Welcome to Forrester University's Onboard Wing Solutions webinar. This webinar is free for you thanks to our sponsor, Vulcan Onboard Scales. Our presenter today is Jerry McCurry from Vulcan Onboard Scales. I'll be introducing Jerry in just a minute, but as we wait for everyone to come online, I'll cover a few housekeeping items. My name is Haley Hogan, and I'm the Product Marketing Manager at Forrester University. I'll be your moderator today, behind the scenes, taking your questions for Jerry throughout the broadcast so he may address them during our question and answer session at the end. Today's webinar is scheduled for approximately one hour with a 15 to 20 minute question and answer session to follow. Those who stay to the end are eligible for a completion certificate towards one PDH and 0.1 CEU credits in states where applicable. These certificates will be emailed to those who qualify. If you have joined us in a group with additional attendees who have registered, please send your attendance form to Zach after the webinar at ztrafney at forrester.net. If you have joined us in a group with additional attendees who have not yet registered, but would like to receive CEU PDH credits, please contact Zach after the webinar and he'll get your attendees registered. Today's webinar is interactive and we encourage you to ask questions throughout. You may do so by entering a question in the question box and clicking send. These will come to me during the session and I will pass these on to Jerry to address during today's question and answer session. If we run out of time today, we'll respond to any remaining questions via email. You may also check your audio here. If you do not have audio, please enter a question in the question box and I will try and help you. There are a few best practices that we recommend for an enjoyable experience. First, we recommend jotting down this website and web ID so if we lose you, you can get back in quickly. Second, we recommend using a high-speed internet connection with all other windows and programs closed to avoid any audio or visual lag. Third, we recommend turning off or setting aside all cell phones to avoid any buzzing or static with the audio. And finally, we are live tweeting this webinar. You can join the conversation on Twitter by following us at ForresterU and including hashtag OnboardScales in your tweets. We will be following your comments and questions during the webinar as well as after. And with that, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Jerry McCurry brings over 25 years of experience in solid waste, disposal logistics, and transportation to Forrester University. McCurry's background in solid waste includes starting, owning, and managing a refuse hauling and recycling business, as well as working for leading refuse equipment manufacturers, including Bain Thin Line Lifter Systems and McNeilis Truck and Manufacturing. Since 1994, McCurry has been with Vulcan Onboard Scales, a Seattle-based industry leader that designs and manufactures state-of-the-art force measurement devices providing products to vocational trucking markets, including timber, refuse, aggregate, and general trucking, as well as solutions for the aerospace, marine, medical, heavy machinery, and process controls. McCurry's responsibilities include managing and growing the company's distribution network for the eastern half of the USA, Caribbean, and South America. And with that, I'll pass the baton off to Jerry, and Jerry will begin today's presentation. Thank you, Haley. As I get my screen here, we will start, and I just want to say good morning. I hope everyone is doing well. I thank you for joining in today. So as we get started, first today, we will be talking about onboard scales and onboard weighing systems and focusing on exactly what onboard scales are and why an onboard weighing program uh, makes sense. For any vocational truck operation. So in a moment, I'll define what a vocational truck operation looks like. But to begin, we'll start with a brief history of onboard scales before looking at how onboard scales work and what components are within a typical onboard scale system. Um, while reviewing refuse truck applications, we'll examine a case study of a current end user to see how they implemented their successful program 
In the end, I'll give you five steps to begin implementing an onboard program within your organization. But first, a question for you. We'll start off with a poll that's completely anonymous, but helps us to know a little bit about where we are all thinking about onboard scales. So the question is this, have you ever considered using onboard scales in your waste hauling fleet? The answers are A, yes, B, no, or C, we're already using onboard scales. So the question again is, have you considered using onboard scales in your waste hauling fleet? A, yes, B, no, or C, we're already using onboard scales. Great, thank you, Jerry. I'll just give everyone a moment to put in their vote. All you need to do is click on the screen with your answer, and it'll send it in to me. And I will close the poll and share the results with everyone. And 46% say no, 44% say yes, and 10% are already using onboard scales. Okay, great. So we're a little bit split on the yes and no. Looks like a few of you are using onboard scales. That's good. Um, this will be fun because we have a lot to learn, especially starting with really where all of this started. So if a vocational truck is a work truck at its core, trucks that fall into this category are dump trucks, garbage trucks, uh, let's say mixers, and they're used to haul equipment or materials and in general, they're used to get a job done. The common denominator of these types of trucks is they typically haul materials or commodities of an unknown weight, and that's real important. Where a freight carrier, for example, would know the amount of weight hauled simply by the summation of the containers or pallets loaded, you know, a vocational truck driver wouldn't have that information available. And this is not a good thing. Every commercial truck driver should know how much weight they're hauling at all times. It's imperative for many, many reasons. So we're familiar with the saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, need or a problem encourages creative efforts to meet the need or solve the problem. Inventiveness and an ingenuity are stimulated by difficulty, right? So such is the way that onboard scales got their start. You know, weighing trucks is not new. Uh, we know that weighing trucks is not new. We're familiar with scales that you can drive over. Uh, portable wheel weighers like the ones we typically see law enforcement agencies pull out of their car trunks to weigh vehicles on level ground. Uh, platform weigh bridges is a type. Uh, and pit type in ground scales. These are all forms of getting necessary weight information so as to make decisions. Do we decrease the amount of material in an overloaded truck or increase an underloaded truck? Do we divert materials from one location to another? Are we meeting federal highway weight standards, for instance, and so forth? And all of this is easy unless you're this poor driver out in the woods and you have no access to conventional type scales. And it was here that onboard scales were born. The weight laws for western states like California, Oregon, and Washington had historically been tough compared to other states. It was like a perfect storm where stringent weight laws converged with a huge timber harvesting and wood hauling industries. No matter how much loaders tried to guess on weights, it was just impossible to know the density and moisture content of each processed tree heading to the mill. Okay, so fear kicks in, and the sheer operational cost of consistently getting overweight tickets becomes the driving force behind the development of onboard scales. So it is that necessity ushered in this invention. Now, with the development of different types of low cells and sensors. In the years that followed, you know, development process, electric onboard scale systems became not only more accurate, but also repeatable. And we'll talk a lot about that in this webinar of the two that you need, both accuracy and repeatability. So different types of load cells and sensors allowed onboard scales to be retrofitted on other types of vocational trucks. 
uh, advancement of electronics allowed more reliability of meters and devices to read weights, and eventually the transmission of these weights outside of trucks in certain instances. Homeboard weighing is now available for a wide range of applications and industries, including aggregate, mining, uh, over the road, mixer trucks, others, um, and aggregate, for example. What does dirt or gravel weigh? Uh, what if the dirt or gravel is wet from rain? Does that change the weight? Uh, yes. Is that important? Yes. What about an off-road articulating dump truck in the mining industry? What if it becomes grossly overloaded and then begins to break down more and more often and requires maintenance and parts replacement? And let's say the truck is in the Katanga province of the Dominican Republic of Congo. Is this a problem? Concrete mixer here that's shown in the picture is a great example of one where a load could be delivered to multiple locations. A couple of yards of material for this job, a few yards of material for another. But how do you best measure the proper amount of material properly distributed to each job? Now, of course, in this webinar, we're focusing on measuring materials that we also recognize as being an unknown in its weight at the point of pickup. And that would be refuse, uh, solid waste, and recyclables. So in the refuse industry or recycling industry, why do we want to know or why do we want onboard scales on these types of vehicles? And what are the tangible benefits of having such a system? Well, eliminate overweight, overweight fines. That's, that's where it started in the Northwest logging industry 35 years ago. And where it began for the refuse industry a few years later in California. Overweight fines and problems are still an issue today. If you think states are getting lenient towards overweights, think again. I know of many areas where DOT officials routinely target the entrance to landfills just waiting to ticket overloaded garbage trucks. Um, some of you on this call today may be facing similar challenges in your respective jurisdiction. A second benefit would be if underloading, if, or excuse me, if overloading is a problem, can underloading be a problem? Of course. What does underloading do to an overall operational efficiency? Underutilization of full truck or trailer capacities is an issue. For those that have transfer operations, um, wasted time spent loading to the optimized weight is an issue. You know, typically, platform scales are at the exit point of the transfer station at the scale house. Once an area is without onboard scales, the loaded truck arrives at the scale house ready to enter the highway, but it's grossly underloaded. Say where the target weight is 80,000 pounds GVW and the actual truck weight is 72,000 pounds. Okay, so the need for a decision arises. Have the truck get back in line to load more refuse or do we just send the truck out? Either way, it's going to cost money either an extra time to load or if you just send it out with 8,000 pounds of lost hauling capacity. You know, just a side note on that, if you choose to send it out 8,000 pounds light, that's four tons, that underloading efficiency is lost and it's a cost that you can never recoup. It's gone forever. Now think about that for a moment. So have you thought about this? What is the cost of maintenance for your trucks? What's the cost of prematurely wearing out the trucks in your operation? Consistent overloading wears down vehicles prematurely, and these are hard dollar, dollar costs in the form of replacement parts and labor costs to repair, you know, not to mention the costs associated with vehicle downtime. Of course, there are big costs in buying new vehicles to replace premature, prematurely worn out vehicles. So the next slide, we're talk, we talk about safety. So for a moment, let's imagine ourselves in the shoes of a truck driver, or rather the driver's seat. 
and think about braking and controlling a truck that's grossly overweight. Add to that an incline or a steep decline or a hairpin curve, things get more interesting. So how does that make you feel? Here's an idea on another topic, liability exposure. Uh, do an internet search today, not now, but after this webinar, but search three words, okay? The three words are overloaded, truck, and wreck. If you search the words overloaded, truck, and wreck, read the latest news articles. Uh, just the list of law firms that advertise online fighting for the rights of drivers who have been injured in truck accidents is a real eye-opener. In the logging industry, for example, we're currently seeing large pulp and paper companies and some sawmills refusing to accept overloaded contractor trucks onto their property just for the fear of taking on this type of liability risk. Simply put, liability costs can be overwhelming. In addition to overweight impacts, let's consider for a moment individual pickup weights for, let's say, a, a front-end loader garbage truck. For waste collection customers to know prof how profitable each customer is, it starts with onboard weighing technology. For waste diversion and best practices to design, measure, and implement waste diversion programs to meet diversion goals or to monitor recycling rebates, it starts with onboard weighing technology. There are some great solutions in the market for this, and there are some that aren't so great. So it really pays to do your homework. This is similar to the last benefit, but it focuses on heavy commercial bins. So I think of a conversation that I had recently with the owner of a medium-sized waste hauling company in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, his company has onboard scales installed on all their front-end loader garbage trucks. He told me they consistently weigh every bin every day for every customer. If they determine a customer bin is consistently heavier than expected, in other words, they don't have the account priced properly, they're losing money on the account, and then they run a weight report. They make an appointment with a customer, and they show the customer why they must raise the monthly service rate. If the customer refuses the rate increase, the hauler just simply cancels the unprofitable account. Because as he said, the owner of the hauling operation said, I'm not in the business of giving away free service. I cannot stay in business losing money on any of my customers. Having onboard scales gives me the confidence to make good pricing decisions. So another benefit is driver retention. So this is a big issue. Um, some of you may know this because these days a good, reliable CDL driver is a very, very valuable asset to the organization. When we hire a good driver, we want to keep him or her. But we don't have to look far to see what is happening right now in many areas where truck drivers are being hit with misdemeanor charges when caught driving overweight trucks. You know, too many tickets and a driver could be facing jail time, literally. So often it's not even the driver's fault because they don't know they're overweight but their CDL driver status is adversely affected. There are a variety of cases right now where these issues are coming to the forefront, including drivers who refuse to drive garbage trucks unless onboard scales are installed. The last benefit we go over is simply put this. Uh, we improve operational efficiency, recording weights, load cycles, dump cycles, routes and service times. You know, good data lead for good decisions. Having weight and other data in real time is priceless. So, okay, at this point, this leads to another poll. And the poll question is this. Can you identify one or more problem areas in your hauling operation that could be eliminated with onboard scales? A for yes, B for no, C, I'm not sure just yet. So the question again, can you identify one or more problem areas in your hauling operation that could be eliminated with onboard scales? A for yes, B for no, and vote C if you're not quite sure. Great, thanks Jerry. We'll just give everyone a couple moments to get their vote in. You can vote A for yes, 
B for no or C for I'm not sure. And I will close the poll and share the results with everyone. And 78% say yes, 20% aren't sure, and 2% say no. Wow, okay. Um, so yes, as we've gone through the benefits, we see all the different areas of things that could be eliminated or improved, issues that we could resolve by onboard scales. So okay, good. Good results. Thanks for taking this poll. So now we just want to know how do electronic onboard scales work? The goal here is not to get too technical, but I do want to give you at least a, a foundational information so that we can start and build our level of understanding. You know, the backbone of any onboard scale system is the load sensor, load cell or sensor, I guess I should say, that's performing the weighing function. So inside load cells and sensors are strain gauges, and a strain gauge is a sensing element. Uh, they're fairly small, you know, about the size of an average thumbnail or fingernail. Um, strain gauges, usually four, are put together in a Wheatstone bridge configuration, as shown here. And this is an electronic bridge circuit that's used to measure resistance. So when the cell is slightly deformed by a load, the deformation pr produces a signal that's proportional to the load. And then the signal is then used to measure weight, force, or deflection. Um, that's a lot, but I'll talk about this just a minute more here in the next two slides. So here's a picture of what a strain gauge mounted on the inside of a typical unfinished load cell where the strain gauge is adhered to the metal web inside. Uh, wires are attached to the strain gauge looking for that resistance to transmit to somewhere else. So a finished load cell would look something like this. And this is a finished shear beam load cell that we use in many trucking applications. Um, rear, rear end loaders, for example, is one where we use these quite often. So these next two slides, I'm going to toggle back and forth just a bit on them. But I'm going to make a distinction between two things, OK? One is a typical load cell. And then the other is a secondary transducer. So if we go back to the typical load cell, a load cell is a primary force measurement device. And it's used to create an electronic signal whose magnitude is directly proportional to the force being measured. In this example, you can see where we put load cells mounted between the front load garbage body and the truck chassis. So what happens is the weight of the refuse or recyclables in the garbage body is going to go directly through the load cells. Um, I always like to say it's like standing on a bathroom scale. All the person's weight's going through, and it's being measured by the load cells in the scale itself. So this approach is usually the most accurate and repeatable form of measurement for this application. And there's many applications um, for this approach. And we'll talk about many applications in this webinar. So going back to the transducer, as opposed to a load cell, a transducer type sensor is where the sensor is measuring deflection. And it can be installed on different types of truck and trailer suspension components, including steel walking beams, front axles, uh, through trunnions, like including MAC camelback suspensions. And the transducers mount directly on the suspension components. Uh, measure the component deflection and convert deflection into a corresponding weight. The transducer mounted on the beam goes kind of along for the ride. They're really measuring the stretch in the steel, something like you'd measure the stretch in a rubber band. It's just a stretch in the steel. It's very small, of course, to the naked eye cannot see it. So typically this approach is less accurate than load cells, but nonetheless also has many applications. Mainly transducers are used in overweight monitoring applications where accurate individual pickup weights are not required. It's important to know these two distinctive different approaches exist and their place in the world of onboard weighing. They each have their pros and they each have their cons. So remember that this webinar is being recorded so that this technical information can be reviewed at any time in the future. So let's look at the building blocks of a complete onboard weighing system. 
And this is what we've really come here for today to kind of go through the different, different types of things that we can do to assemble a system on your particular vehicle or your particular truck application. So for load cells, we have shear beam block style load cells um, used similarly to our last example where we sandwiched with, between the body and the truck chassis frame of many applications. Um, so you see that here, but also you see for rear pivot hinges, shear pins work great. It's the same weighing principle as the block load cell, just for different applications, like for a roll-off truck application, for example. Recognize here load cells that fit tractor fifth wheel applications, uh, trailer spring suspension, and then specialty tight trailer suspensions. And of course, um, front fork load cells. This is the most accurate approach to weighing individual front load container bins. Uh, load cells that are built into the front fork for primary force measurement. As you can see through all these applications, our development of different load cells to meet specific needs. You know, our best teacher has been the end user to allow us to meet their specific need. So another component that could be used to get weight would be pressure sensors. So in some applications where air suspensions are used, air sensors can measure air pressure in the suspension very effectively. Uh, similarly, an application like a roll-off truck or maybe even a dump truck, hydraulic sensors can be used to measure the hydraulic pressure and the hydraulic hoist. These pressure sensors can be easy to install. They're easy to install and yet they're accurate um, in many ways to determine weight. Deflection transducers, um, this type of weight system is an entry point for companies to monitor and control how much any single individual vehicle is hauling. Uh, they typically work very well for monitoring and avoiding overload situations. So we tie the load cells and sensors to electronics. And they're hooked to electronics via wiring harnesses or transmitters to the meters. And typically these meter readouts are mounted in the cab of the truck. This is the most common. Uh, sometimes they're mounted in weatherproof boxes on the outside of the truck or trailer. Uh, some meters are simple to read. Some are just simple display types. Some are smart meters that have clocks and memory built in so that data can be recorded. Um, outputs are part of the configuration, so weight data can be transmitted directly into onboard computers, for instance, uh, to printers or to GPS tracking systems. Uh, all meters provide continual real-time weight feedback to the driver at all times. And remote or wireless displays serve a variety of purposes, and they're especially good for self-loading operations. And scoreboards, this large one here on the right, they're great for broadcasting truck weights to a larger area for many to view. A great example of this is the transfer station operations, as we discuss further in just a moment. So refuse vehicle applications, putting the blocks together. Now that we've identified the individual components of the onboard scale system, we can see which components work well in certain applications. And the first one is front loader solutions. You know, weight needs for front loaders can vary. Sometimes we've seen it's just an overweight monitoring issue only. They're trying to avoid overweights for whatever reason. Uh, most of the time, it's a need for knowing individual bin weights or pickup weights. For overweights only, transducers on the axles are fine. Uh, for individual pickup weights, front fork scales are best. We used to commonly see load cells between the body and truck frame like I used on the previous example. Uh, we don't see that quite as much now because transducers and front fork scales are just easier to install. Rear loaders, we have the same recommendation for overweight monitoring. Uh, load cells are very accurate for ind individual stops as they are for front loaders. And the northeast is uh, where I see most of the install base where this has a lot of tight areas and they require the use of rear loaders for commercial stops. 
Roll-offs often have the ability to tip their load at different places depending on the commodity they're hauling. For example, if the material is CND material or if it's solid waste, they may have a choice as to where to dump it and at varying tipping fees. Onboard scales is an excellent way to make that decision for efficiency and for the lowest fee. Here we use load cell pins in the rear of the hoist in the pivot area and we use a hydraulic sensor up in front of the truck. Now transfer vehicles, they're fairly straightforward. The truck and trailer will either be air suspension or spring suspension and either type is easily scaled. Speaking of transfer vehicle applications, this is a great case study of this type of um, vehicle. And this case study is for Solid Waste Authority of Palm Beach County in Florida. So Solid Waste Authority of Palm Beach, this is a great success story since 1997. And it kind of goes like this, that the problem that they had, the starting point, let's say, was overweight tickets. Uh, this was a trigger that got them to start exploring, exploring options for eliminating the growing mound of fines that they were getting. Um, when they began to really analyze load data, they discovered how much they underloaded as well. So an initial investment was made into like pit type scales and they installed these pit scales right underneath the trucks as they're being loaded in the loading area. Okay, there were problems with this. There were three problems with this. First, as you can imagine, garbage was constantly getting into the scale causing all kinds of problems. Uh, second, water would fill these scales causing electrical shortages. And third problem they had was every time a thunderstorm would come through, which anyone familiar with South Florida knows, it's a daily afternoon event during the summer, uh, lightning strikes would blow the electrical fuse to the system. It was after these issues that Solid Waste Authority came to our long-term distributor in Florida and they came to us and they asked for help. And so the solution was this, that since all tractors had spring suspensions, load cells underneath the fifth wheel plate was the perfect answer. In the trailer, Solid Waste Authority utilizes a Chalmers style spring suspension. There's no problem. We were able to develop a load cell style solution for this as well. After all components were installed and wired together, the meter readout is mounted in the cab of the truck. Now, while a meter like this could be tied to a GPS system or to an onboard computer, um, Solid Waste Authority chooses to have the waste displayed on the scoreboards mounted in each transfer station. Now, this isn't the best picture, but you can see, looking in the back wall of the loading area, two scoreboards mounted to the wall. As the loader is driving and pushing the refuse into the trailers below, he's able to see a live reading of the truck weights. It's a very efficient system. So the results are this. Over 100 tractors, 100 trailers using the system. First thing that happened was there was no more overweight issues. Second thing is they determined that yard time, the amount of time waiting and getting loaded, uh, driving around, trying to get the perfect load before going on to the interstate, it went from 25 minutes to 15 minutes per truck. Average payloads increased dramatically. The average payload back in the 1990s when we started this project was a little over 16 tons per vehicle. After the onboard scale program got underway, average payloads began to reach the 18 ton mark consistently. But as efficiency increased, you saw the Waste Authority was now motivated to look for other ways to increase payloads. Plans began to find other ways to lighten the trucks and lighten the trailers. So what's happened today is with the implementation of the scale program and lighter trucks and aluminum trailers, Average payloads today are 21 and a half tons consistently. So for over 100 trucks in the system, that's pretty substantial. 
As a result, less drivers are needed, less equipment is needed, less fuel consumption, and of course the list goes on. So this is a good example of where the innovation of starting an onboard scale program sometimes carries examination over to other areas of the operation. The end result is maximum optimization of the equipment that you've invested in. So here we show a histogram. So it goes to show that if you have a target in mind on this histogram, the technology is there to support it. It's just a matter of finding the best fit for your particular operation and seeking out the right tools. So this, what you're seeing, is like for the city of Los Angeles trucks. Okay, their goal was to average uh, 50,000 pounds GVW, gross vehicle weight, per garbage truck. The solution for them happened to be transducers rather than load cells. In this histogram, you can see that the target weight is consistent within a percent or two. And this is the blue line that you see here in the middle. Again, 50,000 pounds GVW trucks without the scales, the yellow marks here, the yellow line, are all over the board uh, with different weight samples that are taken. So this was a real study done a few years ago. It was controlled. We had 126 data points for comparison. And if there's anything to remember from this slide, it's the yellow line here. It's to remember how weights are all across the board without any type of onboard weighing system. So as the title implied, we spent a lot of time in this presentation on scales, you know, the onboard weighing side of things. Uh, we've done that on purpose. Gathering data and analyzing it is important to make decisions on but it has to be good information. We say that data is only good as your scale system. You know, analyzing bad data or bad numbers leads to bad decisions. It does you no good. But once you have accurate and repeatable onboard scales in place, I will repeat that it must be accurate and repeatable, then it may be time to bring in other data management systems to integrate with the scales especially scenarios where the focus is on individual pickups or individual bin weights. So with a basic scale system, it's possible to download roll numbers into a spreadsheet uh, for analysis. With a VAR, a value-added reseller or a partner, Things such as container RFID tagging and time stamping capabilities can come into play. Route optimization and GPS can be very helpful. And with great improvements in geofencing and in Google mapping, real-time positioning and tying video cameras and all sorts of information gathering systems, the amount of data is limitless. And all of this is great for making great optimization of vehicle efficiency decisions. Uh, we work with all the great providers of these systems, and our part is providing accurate and repeatable scale systems. So with that, here's our last poll. And the poll goes like this. What type of hauling truck is predominant in your fleet? Just get a feel for what you have in our audience here today. So what type of hauling truck is predominant in your fleet? A, front-end loaders. B, rear loaders. C, roll-offs. D, transfer trailers. Or E, in your operation, you may have all the above. So I'll read that question one more time. What type of hauling truck is predominant in your fleet? A, front loaders. B, rear loaders. C, roll-offs, D, transfer trucks and trailers, or E, maybe you have a mix of all. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Just be sure to put in your vote. All you need to do is click on the screen, and I will tally up the results on my side, and I'll close the poll and share the results with everyone. And... We have 25% say all of the above. Uh, 
tie for 20% with front loaders, rear loaders, and transfer trailers, and 14% say roll off. Okay. So there are some here today that have an equal mix of all of the above, or at least have some of each of these trucks. So as we, this is good, and thank you for taking that poll. So as we go to our next part of this webinar, um, we talked about a, we think we talked about a wide variety of systems and applications. Um, now it's time to take some steps that you can take to get started with an onboard weighing program of your own. So we've come up with the acrostic way, W-E-I-G-H. And so it might seem so obvious as to being the starting point, but the challenge is to determine exactly what are your specific issues are for your operation. You know, are, is it simple overweight issues? Is that your biggest concern? Uh, or is it knowing the weight of each individual pickup? Is that your biggest need? In many cases, it could be both overweight and individual pickup weights. You really need to know this. Take the time to assess that as to choose the proper type of scale system required for your operation. Um, transducers may serve the bill for one, and load cells may foot the bill for the other. So it's important to know this information before you proceed. So E stands for evaluate. And we've touched on the differences between load cells for primary force and transducers for secondary force measurement. It's been our experience that where individual pickups and where high accuracy is important, load cells are a good answer. Um, overweight monitoring secondary force measurement devices like transducers work great. Um, make sure you know the difference and evaluate the system that's right for you and for your truck application. So I stands for invest. If this is your first experience with onboard scales, and it sounds like for a lot um, in this webinar today, there might be quite a few that this would be our first experience. We often recommend that you purchase and install and do a trial of at least one system. Um, two to three systems is actually optimum, especially if you have a larger fleet. Um, to account for unexpected truck breakdowns or other issues. And one of the things that we can do is to give an outline and a template as to how to run a successful test. The G stands for gather. Um, you know, a good test should probably last anywhere from 30 to 60 days, um, sometimes longer, um, sometimes shorter. But 30 to 60 days is a good average. And during that time, we quantify the results again against a non-scaled vehicle. And like we always say, you can't manage what you can't measure. All right, so this guy's kind of funny. He's a little corny. But I use this picture for H, for harvest, um, to hopefully help us to remember two things. First, the payback for an onboard weighing system is typically short. We have many customers reporting that average paybacks are anywhere between three and nine months. Um, honestly, six months or shorter on average for a payback. And the second thing to remember with this little guy here is that onboard scales are design, that designed to last a long time. So when you harvest the results and you think about your scale system with proper care, it's expected the scale systems to last as long as the life of your vehicle if not longer. And we have in some cases where some users will remove the onboard scale systems from the retired trucks and reinstalled on their new replacement trucks. So who is Vulcan onboard scales? Finally, just a quick overview of who Vulcan onboard scales is. You know, most know our company in the marketplace is Vulcan. The name of our corporate is Stress Tech Inc. And Stress Tech Inc. was founded in 1978, originally provided professional consulting services in the fields of transducer design and experimental stress analysis. Our operations expanded to design and manufacture onboard weighing systems known as Vulcan onboard scales. Vulcan is located in Kent, Washington, about 20 miles south of Seattle, uh, near the SeaTac Airport. 
This is where all of our engineering, design, and manufacturing for Vulcan onboard scales and family of products takes place. Our facility, um, manufacturing all of our systems in the United States, um, gives us great quality control over our products and allows for quick technical response time. Uh, a portion of our business is still tied to medical and aerospace industries and allows for us to become involved in some highly technical and complex scale related projects. And the technical innovation, expertise, and capital equipment investments resulting from these custom force markets are used to subsidize innovation and new product design and manufacturing of onboard scales. So the majority of our employees have been with the company for 15, 20 years or more. Uh, many of us have grown up, so to speak, in this industry. Together we've learned a lot over time. Uh, recently when we added things up, we realized that we had over 400 years of combined onboard scale experience. We actually have over 300 low cell designs and more than 15 patents with additional patents pending. So a lot of information. Um, let's recap. And we'll recap what we've talked about today. And I'll go right to the slide here. That in conclusion I'll say this. Um, one, onboard scales are a tried and tested means of knowing your load weight at all times. Um, two, we learn there are a variety of load cells and sensors available, each designed for a specific purpose and application. And three, uh, the key is to decide on the level of accuracy required and what best fits your specific operational goals. And finally, implement the way approach. It's a simple way to begin a program that best suits your specific objective. Haley, I'll pass it back to you. All right. Great. Thank you, Jerry. So I have just a few housekeeping items before we start today's question and answer session. First, your feedback is important to us, so please take a minute to complete the short survey, which will pop up after the webinar is complete. Second, prior to the webinar, we emailed a link to the PDF of today's presentation. If you didn't receive it, please contact Zach at zetrafney at forrester.net. Third, the webcast version of this webinar will be available for your viewing and for purchase by others. This full session is recorded, so if you missed any part of this webinar or would like to view it again, you may do so via the link we will email tomorrow. You'll be able to access this recording for 12 months. We will also be emailing certificates to those of you who stayed the length of this webinar. If you do not receive a certificate, please contact Zach at zetrafney at forrester.net. If you have joined us in a group with additional attendees who have already registered, please send your attendance form to Zach after the webinar. If you have joined us in a group with additional attendees who have not yet registered, but would like to receive CEU PDH credits, please contact Zach at zetrafney at forrester.net. And with that, we'll put up Jerry's contact information and information on our upcoming webinars, including our Creating Sustainability Program Set Stick Masterclass Series presented by Antonia Graham, starting with our Sustainability Program and Green Marketing Webinar on Thursday, April 16th, then moving to our Creating Your Sustainability Plan Webinar on Tuesday, May 12th, and finishing up with our Applying Metrics and community-based social marketing webinar on Thursday, June 4th. And our waste and byproduct use in road construction webinar presented by returning speaker David Hine on Thursday, September 24th. And be sure to check out our on-demand library at foresteruniversity.net with over 150 webcasts, including our Zero Waste Masterclass series presented by Antonia Graham and our Process Improvement for Solid Waste Facilities Masterclass, presented by Neil Bolton. And with that, we will open it up for questions. Our first question comes from Paul, and he asks, what are typical costs to outfit a truck with onboard scales? 
Thank you, Paul. Yeah, good question. Uh, scale systems range in prices uh, across the board, as you can imagine, depending on the application of your vehicle. Uh, you typically see on the lower end transducer-based systems um, anywhere in the $2,500 range going up to some really complex systems that we've done in the mining industry and even in some of the refuse industries that we've done that are a bit more involved with load cells and different types of add-ons. Um, you can get upwards of over $10,000 or so, $12,000 or so. So it, it varies and it ranges depending on your application and therefore that's um, another reason to make sure that you investigate uh, as you're looking at onboard scale systems. Look at the objective and look at what you're trying to achieve with the systems and uh, implement a, a pilot program to test that out. But uh, the good question on prices, they do, they do range just a bit. Um, and in some people's minds, they might be a little bit less expensive than you would think. Great question. Thank you, Paul. And a question in from Stuart. He asks, is this type of weighing legal for trade? I get that question um, often, and that's a good question. Thank you, Stuart. Um, we see that legal for trade scales is popular in other parts of the world. Uh, we see it especially in Europe. Uh, European refuse and waste collection and recycling operations have adapted uh, legal for trade operations for quite some time. Uh, we don't see it much in the United States. So there's two ways to answer this. One is that the scale systems that we have available, especially load cell type, are very, very accurate. But taking that step to get certified legal for trade, we typically don't see that. Matter of fact, I'm not aware of any in the refuse industry in my area that has any either municipal or private hauling that is using onboard scales for the refuse operation. Um, now I am aware of some certified for scales, um, certified scale systems for trucks. Uh, there's one particular one that's come out of Canada that I see sometimes for straight trucks and it is used I see sometimes for things where you're dropping off precise measurements of grain or to a chicken feed um, farm or something of that nature, liquids or something. You'll see it every once in a while, but uh, going back to the 1990s, uh, a lot of the big private haulers at that time did look into certification and determine it just wasn't what they wanted to do as far as pricing their customers uh, by a certain amount of weight, for example, you know, a dime a pound or uh, five cents a pound or something of that nature, they didn't want to get that, that go down that path. So what we recommend instead, let's talk about front loaders, for example, where you're trying to base pricing that's equitable and it's fair depending on the weight of your customers. Let's talk about restaurants versus maybe a lightweight customer, um, a florist, let's say. Uh, both of them may have eight-yard containers, but the heavier container at the restaurant is going to cost you more to service and to tip at the landfill. So what is legal to do is to put your customers in pricing categories. And typically we recommend five categories and that you can put your customers in those pricing categories and charge accordingly. Uh, no problem with that. Um, legal for trade as far as coming back and actually like I said a moment ago, paying or charging a, a, an exact price per pound uh, may come into the United States uh, in the future. Um, I know there's some companies that are looking at introducing that here and maybe trying to get, uh, as we're doing a lot of recycling and waste aversion plans, it may come back. But right at the moment, um, we don't see much of it in this industry at least. All right. Thank you, Stuart. Great question. And a question in from Steve. He asks, how often do the scales need to be serviced and what is the O and M cost? Um, yeah, very good. Service, two questions. I'll, I'll answer one maybe that you didn't ask, but uh, servicing and calibration. Um, calibration, typically for load cell operations, we see that calibration is very infrequent. 
luckily we see with load cell applications where you calibrate the system unless there's a huge adverse effect to the truck, such as being in a wreck or something of that nature, is typically you might not have to recalibrate that system, but maybe once a year at most. Um, maintenance cost, uh, we find that since there's no actual moving parts inside the load cells or the transducers or sensors, uh, everything's encapsulated. So the key is an installation and routing wires properly and making sure that the installation is done very well on the front end. And when that happens, since there's no grease points or any moving parts to lubricate or maintain, uh, maintenance costs typically on all of these systems that we've talked about today are very low, and in some cases, virtually there's virtually no maintenance costs whatsoever. All right, great question, Steve. Thank you. And a question in from Paul. He asks, do the load cells and transducers require periodic recalibration, and if so, how often, typically? Yeah, and that's going back to what I just said with calibration. Um, load cells typically are less frequent. Um, transducers tend to be a little bit more frequently. And there's not an across-the-board answer to that, but it is based on application. Transducers require just a little bit more calibration time, typically because they are a secondary force measurement, where some companies will say there's actually like a, a set-in time or a seating time for the transducers to be installed before they actually are calibrated and used. Um, once they are calibrated and used, if you have some operational um, tendencies where a truck driver might be rough or there might be some things, calibration might be a little bit more frequent. You could have um, calibration maybe where you might need to take a look at that and cal calibrate it once a month, potentially. But in mo most cases, most applications that we're talking about here in this industry, is that if the installation is done properly, the calibration is done well the first time, um, again, it could be as little as once a year uh, at most. So, Paul, thanks for that question. Yes, thank you, Paul. Great question. And a question in from Valerie. She asks, can any of these options be used on the arms which lift carts and mobile shredding trucks? Yes. Hey, that's a good question. Um, there's some really interesting configurations of trucks that uh, have come about in the past few years. Um, we have some trucks that we do transducers on that are quite accurate, actually. I'll give one example. Um, is these rendering trucks where they're lifting restaurant waste or oils or grease or fats into the back of the rendering truck with an arm. Um, these systems do fit those trucks. Uh, load cells being a little bit more expensive, uh, we found with a rendering truck, again, for example, that transducers on the arms work very well for that. There are other applications where you wouldn't want to put a transducer on the arm, but you would want to use a load cell. And again, it just all depends on the configuration of of all the industries we're in, it's quite in interesting that it seems like the refuse and waste hauling industry has quite a few configurations. I covered today the most um, common, I guess, rear loaders, front loaders, roll-offs, transfer trucks and trailers. Um, of course, side loaders uh, is an application, is a truck, and these rendering trucks and things like that where you're picking up carts or cans or things of that nature or filling up a bin. There, for us, there's always a way to do it. It's a matter of what technology have we developed, what experience have we used in the past, what very type of suspensions or body types have we done, what success ratio have we had with all of those. And the advantage of having an engineering team here in the United States that's gone through the learning curve of over that for the past uh, two or three decades is, is an advantage. And, so the answer is, is that we can usually figure out a way to weigh just about any type of mobile application. Great question. Thanks for that. Great. Thank you, Valerie. And a question in from Lori. She asks, are these systems affected by cold temperatures? No, they're not. Um, good question. Uh, temperature, uh, 
sensors are typically uh, temperature compensated in the manufacturing process. There's a lot of uh, treating that's done to load cells and sensors to avoid, as you can imagine in the examples that I used at the beginning of this presentation, the industries that we're in in the onboard market, vocational truck market, well, there's some really tough industries, um, really rugged industries. So where you've got cold temperatures, uh, extremely hot, humid temperatures, you've got salt on the road and, and snow areas, um, you've got a lot of debris. In the logging industry, you have a tendency where you know, heavy loads can be really dropped onto the trailer itself. Uh, you have a lot of variables that require going back to the engineering, the man manufacturing side of things is to make sure you've done things right. So temperature compensation is one, um, coatings and things of that nature to resist rust and corrosion is another. Um, done a pretty good job over the years of developing load cells and sensors and wiring harnesses that are met to our specifications to make things last for a long time. Otherwise, I would not have been able to say like I did earlier that you know, a system should last as long as the vehicle life that you're using it on, if not longer. So, yeah, great question. There's a lot of variables out there. It's a rough world, and we put a lot of engineering time into that to try to resolve all those issues, and I think we've done a pretty good job. Thanks for that question. Okay, great question. Thank you, Lori. And a question in from Andrew. He asks, do meters and remote displays show the weight of the full truck and load, or just the load being put on? Um, both, actually. Meters can be set up to show gross load. And the way we would do that, and this is one example, the way we would do gross load is we would plug in the empty tear weight of the empty truck and trailer, if that's the scenario we would plug that number into the meter and store it. So if you can imagine, we would go with an empty truck, empty trailer, full of fuel with the driver in it, go get it weighed. We would plug that number in as our baseline. And then from there, as the refuse or the recycling materials are added, then it would increase the weight on the meter scoreboard up to the total load. Um, that's the, the most normal scenario that we have in the refuse industry. Some, some industries will say, we want our scale to read uh, zero. And so whatever is put on that zero weighted truck, then that's what I want to look at. So I want to see just what the net is. And fortunately, some of the improvements that have taken place over the past uh, decade especially has been in electronics. So the ability to toggle between net loads, uh, gross payloads, and then, as we've talked a lot about today, individual pickup weights. The electronics are able to toggle between all of those to get the information that you're looking for. And in some cases, we'll have drivers to say, all we want is gross load, put my empty tear weight in, and I don't want to touch the meter ever again. And if that's the case, then we will lock it into that and lock the driver out and especially if we have a GPS type system or some sort of remote monitoring system for that, the driver actually has no interaction at that point in time. Someone would be reading the weight in a distant location and that would be it. Now the driver would always see a live reading in his truck um, unless we put that meter in a different location, but since it is a live reading at all times, it's reading the load cells and sensors at all times, he would still get that reading. We would just let that information go somewhere else uh, for process and for data analysis. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Great question. And a question in from Terry. Are, there, are these onboard weighing systems NTEP certified for legal trade? Yeah, that goes back to the um, question earlier. And I think I gave a pretty good explanation of that, but uh, uh, the answer in the way we use these scales here in the United States is, is no, we're not using them for uh, that type of um, application. And again, uh, you might see that in some other areas, uh, Europe especially, but uh, these that we've talked about today, uh, we're putting them for monitoring of information that we need to know, overweight situations, or in the case of individual pickup, 
we are using that information to put our customers in grouping categories so we can determine if we're profitable or if we're diverting re recyclables to the proper areas. So, um, no, good question. Those, those questions uh, come up uh, pretty often, and so this is common. And uh, I thank you for thank you for asking that. Great, thank you, Terry. And a question from Steve. He asks, um, you said that NE requires weights for commercial stops. Do you have the statute or rule reference? Ask that question one more time. Sure. Um, you mentioned that NE requires weights for commercial stops. Do you happen to have the statute or rule reference? Um, I'm not sure where that question is coming. I'm not sure what that's asking, to be quite honest with you. Okay, We're asking. Well, yeah, go ahead. We can um, follow up via email and get more uh, clarification. Yeah, that'd be great. For more clarification, uh, feel free to to shoot an email to me, and I'd be happy to to go more through that uh, and explore that with you as to what you're what you're looking for on that. No problem. Sure. All right. Thank you, Steve. And a question from Matthew. He asks, um, any opportunity to have a system installed on a non-powered piece of equipment? For example, installed on a roll-off container itself so the system isn't dependent upon the vehicle? Yes, um, we have done that in several scenarios. In that particular application that you're asking about, we've done quite a few times. Uh, the power to drive the meter typically comes off of the battery of a typical truck in these applications we've talked about. Now, if you have a remote type of setup, there's two ways of doing that. It either would be, A, when you plug that trailer into a power source, uh, i.e. a tractor or some sort of truck, then we would power the scale system that way. The other way is to use a deep cycle marine battery uh, that you could use to hook the meter up. Basically what happens is, is that we're powering the meter and from the meter the power goes back to the load cells and the, sen and the sensors. So if you deliver power to that meter, be it um, in this type of scenario that you're describing, maybe a, a remote battery, a, a deep cycle marine battery type of scenario, or something that you would hook up to something else temporarily. Um, as long as we get that uh, 12 volt, 24 volt, we, we're good with that. We can get that power. In a lot of cases, we find in other industries, we're actually doing those types of scenarios now with uh, portable platform scales in the logging industry, for instance. So a portable platform scale would have the load cells and sensors and wiring harnesses inside the platform. But of course, being out in the middle of the woods, there's nowhere to plug that in. So that's where we go back to some really good technology and innovation, of course, that's happened in that industry as well, where batteries uh, can last for quite some time and then be recharged at night, sometimes in some cases be recharged once a week, uh, maybe even less and then you've got the power source you need to power um, the scale system. So, uh, no, that's not uncommon, and that's, that's, that's also a good question. And hearing questions like this brings up things when you do a presentation, you think, okay, maybe the next presentation I'll put more applications, more trucks and things like that in. Um, and some of these, it seems to be when we get feedback, uh, if any of you in this webinar today would love to send feedback and we start seeing a pattern, gosh, there's a lot of people with rendering trucks or things of that nature, or in this case, a trailer that may be used as a roll-off without constant power. Maybe that would be something that would be put in the next presentation. So uh, these are good ideas, good things to share, and, and good questions. All right, great. Thank you, Matthew. And we have a question in from Ken Kenson. He asks, um, for the front loader fork system, how do you care for an empty bin? Um, yes, the fork scale system uh, comes from our factory uh, calibrated, so to speak. So there's lots of instances once you put that fork scale system on a front loader, it's ready to go to work. How do we tweak that or how do we make sure it's in perfect calibration? Uh, the answer is to have a known weight that we can lift those forks uh, or lift up on those forks. And we can tweak it to that, dial it in is what we say, or tune it into that. So a large fleet front loaders, we like to see 
so that there's not a lot of um, transporting or wasting time to find a, a known weight somewhere, is that a lot of times we'll say, hey, take a two-yard container, a two-yard bin, and let's put some concrete in that, maybe weld the lid shut or do something of that nature, and let's weigh that container, and, and let's, let's target something a little bit heavier than normal, let's say 2,000-pound container or maybe something even heavier, and let's leave that container in our yard. And so what we'll do to calibrate is we will go and lift that container up and dial that in um, precisely. And then any time there needs to be a recalibration, if re recalibration needs to occur, then we'll use that as our base source. We'll use that container as our calibration container, so to speak. So uh, that's the best way to handle that, and that's what's most common. And um, yeah, thanks, thanks for that as well. That's a good one. All right. Great question, Kenson. Thank you. And we have a question in from Amity. They ask, what is typical accuracy for front and separately for rear load onboard scale systems? Yeah, in the presentation that we talked about the two different types, um, accuracy um, for, let's go for load cells versus transducers. What we typically say is that um, load cells you typically see within 1% GVW, um, or some people say it's 99% accurate. Um, so that's what we typically see in load cells across the board, no matter what industry it's in. Logging industry, we, we say within 1%, sometimes half percent. But refuse industry, we'd say within 1%. Um, we find that transducers uh, can be uh, accurate to anywhere from 1% to 3%. So on average, we typically say 2, two to 3% is about where we find uh, accuracy levels for transducers. With that histogram and actually knowing and going and doing tests is why we feel like we're very strong in being able to, to claim accuracy levels. Without data, without testing, without knowing, without doing long-term testing, it's a, bit of a, it's a bit of a game and it's a bit of um, a guess, I guess is the way to say it, as to what accuracy levels are. But testing and doing controlled tests and um, doing mounds and mounds of data that if you came into our office you would see us, uh, <laughs> that we've we accumulated over the years, then you would find that the reason we're able to say within 1% GVW of load cell type applications and typically 2 or 3% transducers, um, then that, that's where that comes from. And so that's been our experience. And, um, so yeah, very good, very good question on that as well. All right, thank you, Amity. Great question. And we have time for just a few more questions here. We have one from Ronald, and he asks, "What is the accuracy of your scales?" Yeah, just like this last one that I just answered. Um, let's 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 state again. Uh, typically within one percent load cells, and typically. Typically, one to three percent, average of two to three percent on transducers. All right, thank you, Ronald. And we have a question from Steve. He asks, "How is fuel usage considered on the route when weighing?" Um, that's a really good question. Actually, we do um, account for that, and it's it's funny sometimes that in some applications that tends to be the only um, inaccuracy that there is. Um, for example, in a lot of applications where we're able to get really tight with the calibration and get it down to, you know, within a half percent or better, sometimes the only variance or a big part of the variance will be fuel burn. So to be on the safe side of that, and there's really not much way around it, to be on the safe side of that, we'll typically calibrate and again, I like using examples, but let's calibrate a transfer truck and trailer, for instance. We like to calibrate that transfer truck and trailer with uh, a fuel, uh, a full fuel tank, a tank full of fuel, with a driver in the truck, uh, the typical driver that's in that truck. So if we calibrate to that, then we'll know that if we have an inaccuracy at the end of the day, that could be, let's say, 500 pounds, 600 pounds of something of that nature, We'll know a lot of that 
and we're, I'm calling it an inaccuracy. It's not an inaccuracy. It's just a caliber. It's a, it's a calculation of weight. We've seen fuel burn, so fuel does weigh, um, you know, a good amount. Um, so over a period of a day of burning out, um, you know, several gallons of diesel fuel, then you'll you'll know that you've got some variances there. And if you account for those, then you'll know. Okay, well, based on volume and based on a weight of a gallon of diesel fuel then you'll know if your scale's off at the end of the day by 300 pounds or 400 pounds, then a lot of that can be accounted for fuel. So we'll err to that side of being safe as opposed to erring to the other side of trying to calibrate a truck and trailer with an empty fuel tank and go the other way. Um, I'd rather us see us be a, a little underloaded um, as opposed to overloaded any time. And I go back to Solid Waste Authority because they are such a good case study and there's so many things to learn from them, that is what they do in their operation for 100 trucks and trailers. So if we use them as an example, they will literally load their trucks and trailers to 79.5, and that's their target weight. And so with that amount of variance of, let's say, 500 pounds, because the target's 80,000, then they're safe and they're good with that. And so that's kind of how they do that as well. But uh, hey, we've got some good questions today. These are really good. So that's a good thought. And fuel burn is accounted into that and that does have an effect on that. So thanks for throwing that question as well. All right, great. Thank you, Steve. And one last question today from Granger. He says he loves the webinar and he's wondering how do you mitigate against non-owner operator drivers? disconnecting or sabotaging the scale so they can plead ignorance to their management when they are overloaded. He's thinking of the waste driver who just wants to finish his route and go home and doesn't want to go to the landfill before. Well, it's, that's a good question, and, and let's, let's not kid ourselves to think that that doesn't happen sometimes. So there's been, gosh, um, I don't know, I can't count how many ways that we've gotten around that. They're in the inherent systems themselves is the way they're designed and manufactured. There are lockouts to the meters, for example, um, to where the, the driver, uh, without a code and touching the meter, he can play with the meter all he wants to and manipulate numbers, but nothing will be changed because there's a lockout code that does not allow that driver to do that. Um, I, get, I get these questions sometimes in other countries, and especially doing a lot of work recently in um, some other countries outside the United States, I get the questions about tampering or cutting wires, things like that. that nothing, is, um, nothing is perfect. Nothing is completely, whether it be our trucks, our scales, our houses, our homes, our cars, nothing is 100% um, foolproof, so to speak, uh, to where it cannot be tampered with. But there are ways around that. In, in this industry, the refuse and waste recycling industry, we have added some components for some of our customers to have uh, tamper-proof type boxes, locks, override keys, uh, override codes in the meters and things like that. Um, but that doesn't still eliminate the um, someone from going and, let's say, clipping a wire uh, somewhere between the truck and the trailer. Uh, I don't know that we'll ever get that much to where we want to spend that kind of money putting everything in conduit and making it absolutely 100% bulletproof. Then you're talking about a scale system that's probably priced very, very high. Um, so in the case of Solid Waste Authority, uh, again, they treat their drivers as professionals, uh, as they are professionals, uh, CDL drivers uh, with what they, the rigorous amount of work they have to go through to be a good certified um, commercial driver um, should be treated as professionals. In, in the case of Solid Waste Authority, they do. Now, along with professionalism comes a sense of responsibility and accountability. And so if we're going to run an operation where we are all playing in the same field and we're trying to go towards a common goal, then we have accountability levels. So in some areas where that tampering goes on with drivers and things of that nature, I would think that hopefully we'd have a, a procedure in mind to, to eliminate those types of uh, employees. But um, in any case, coming back to the technical side or the, the, the equipment side, um, 
there are uh, systems in place that we can add in addition to what you've seen here today. And some of them are the lockout type boxes or override keys or things of that nature that try our best to make things as tamper-proof as possible. So thanks for that question. All right, great question. Thank you, Granger. And that concludes today's question and answer session. If we didn't get a chance to answer your question during our session, we will follow up via email. And with that, Jerry, do you have any final comments for today's audience? Yes, Haley. You know, as, as you stated earlier, I've been in the waste and refuse industry for a long time. And as my team and I were putting this presentation together, you know, it really occurred to me how important this topic of knowing loaded truck weights is today. Um, I mean, I've been doing this for a while, but to know loaded truck weights today more than any other time in history is absolutely vital to any and every trucking operation. Um, so, you know, we're all influenced by the information that's thrown our way every day, the radio, television, the internet, et cetera. Hopefully, I'll say, if nothing else, that the information presented here today has influenced us all to take a look, a proactive look, at our own truck weights and the absolute importance of knowing this information. And thank you um, all today who's been in this webinar. I appreciate your attendance. All right. Thank you, Jerry. And thank you all for joining us today. And thank you to our sponsor, Vulcan Onboard Scales. Vulcan Onboard Scales are manufactured by Stress Tech Incorporated, which was found in 1978 and originally provided professional consulting services in the fields of transducer design and experimental stress analysis. Today, they provide onboard weighing systems to multiple trucking markets, including solutions for refuse, aggregate, timber, general trucking, concrete, mining, and more. And we hope you can join us for some of our upcoming webinars, including our Sustainability That Sticks Masterclass Series, presented by Antonio Graham, exploring the opportunities, challenges, and best practices in creating, implementing, and effectively marketing your sustainability plan. Starting with our sustainability program and green marketing webinar on Thursday, April 16th, exploring sustainability, what it really is and isn't, how to avoid greenwashing and employ successful green marketing techniques, and how you can better engage your community or organization to buy into and commit long-term to your sustainability program. Then moving to our Creating Your Sustainability Plan webinar on Tuesday, May 12th, exploring the step-by-step -step process of how you can build your sustainability plan for success, including defining your audience, target, and key elements, setting your goals and key performance indicators, crafting and rolling out your implementation plan, and tracking your program with key metrics and analysis and finishing up with our Applying Metrics and Community-Based Social Marketing Webinar on Thursday, June 4th, exploring how you can better measure and manage your sustainability plan, including defining and tracking to, measure, to measurable sustainability indicators, driving awareness and long-term behavioral change with proven social marketing strategies, and ultimately measuring the effectiveness of your sustainability plan. And our Waste and Byproduct Use in Road Construction webinar presented by returning speaker David Hine on Thursday, September 24th, exploring the wide range of waste and byproduct materials you can use in your pavement construction, along with their advantages and disadvantages. Best practices for implementation and the importance of testing and inspection for your site's success. Until next time, thank you and have a great day.